Okay, so as a follow-on to what we talked about last time when we went through the data rates and the uh, nomenclature behind uh, T1 in the, in the synchronous digital hierarchy, we're going to talk about how we actually accomplish some of that transfer today. And the first thing is to realize that what we're doing is putting a copper media, that is a conductive media. I'm going to send voltage and current across this thing. Or more precisely, I'm going to put voltage across the wire pairs, and I'm going to use that to push current through. What I am going to be signaling are individual bits. We're talking layer one at a very basic level here. So what I'm going to do in this form of coding is I'm going to, and I make up the voltages to keep it easier to deal with the numbers. Uh, the voltages can actually vary a little bit depending on what you're doing. We'll assume they're stable. What, at its most basic, what we're doing is taking the voltage across that wire pair and varying it between no voltage on the wire pair and some voltage. I've used five volts in this diagram. And we're going to use some sort of coding scheme like if there is no voltage on the line, that's a logical zero. If there is a voltage on the line, that's a logical one. Okay. Now remember, this is a synchronous network. So we're not waiting for a packet header to start looking at this. This is always sending bits. Okay, now you get to do one of those silly things that everybody talks about, John. Come on. How do you know when to clap? Come on. Yes, I'll stand up here and do it all day until you join in. How do you know when to clap? Okay. Boy, you guys did that well. <laughs> Usually it kind of rattles on for a little bit. How did you know when to clap your hands each time? What had we established? We'd established a timing reference. I had given you a pace that we were going to clap in. So, so now you can go home and say you clapped in class. Uh, that's essentially what we do here. We set up an expected timing. And what I'm actually defining is how much time I'm going to use to represent a single bit. So in the first time slot, I'm going to represent this bit. In the next time slot, I'm going to represent this bit. Actually, this one would have been the first one out the door. But every time that amount of time, that time slot goes by, I'm going to represent the value of a bit in that slot every single time. It doesn't even matter if I don't have any data to send. I'm going to represent the value. Now, what do you do if you don't have data to send? Hold that thought. We'll talk about it a little later. Okay. So, in other words, this isn't, you've got, you've got to divorce yourself from the way you've learned to think, which is packet. This never stops. Once I turn this on, I'm always sending bits to you. Okay. What's the average voltage on that wire in that diagram? And when we looked at this, when we looked at voltage going over a wire in uh, 121 or nowadays 301, what happens to a signal, that we even talked about it in here, what happens to an electrical signal when you put it on a wire pair and then let it move down more and more and more wire? It does degrade ex specifically. How does it degrade? Two things. Gets up heat, and where does the heat come from? The wire eating up because it, I've put power, I've put a voltage on this wire, I've caused current to flow. Some of the energy that I'm transferring across that copper loop is used to heat the wire. Well, if I use it to heat the wire, I can't use it <laughs> at the receiving end. So what happens is the amplitude, the height of this pulse, as you put more and more and more wire in here and move it further and further down, this amplitude gets smaller and smaller. What's the other problem with copper transmission media? Noise. Noise. Okay. In addition to the signal getting smaller, and we talked about this when we talked about analog transmission, in addition to the signal getting smaller, I'm inducing noise on this. And the noise comes from all, you know, all different sources. This is actually studies of where this noise came from or actually how they came up with the idea of the Big Bang and cosmic rays and all that. They found induced 
voltage that they couldn't, the induced current they couldn't explain away when they were looking at all this stuff. And that's, that's ultimately what it ended up being, was background radiation. So you can't get rid of the noise. It's built into our universe. The problem is when that signal degrades to the point that it's the same level roughly as the noise or a little below it, I can no longer determine in an analog world, I can no longer determine what is signal and what is noise. So I've lost the, the information I was trying to send across the network. Okay. So we do some tricks to get around that. First thing is obvious, we limit the distance we send data over a span. This is one of those magic number things. T1 spe is specified a maximum length of 6,000 feet. Why? Because Bell system equipment vaults, manholes, if you will, were spaced 6,000 feet apart in New York City. That's how far I had to send a signal. I designed a signal to go that far. That's how far it goes. Can I put 6,200 feet of wire in it? Sure. Will it work? Maybe. Probably. But not in spec. Okay, so that's, that's the magic number part of it. The problem with doing that is exactly what you answered when I said, what's the average voltage? Two and a half volts. If I tell you zero volts, I'm on the sending end, I tell you zero volts is a logical zero and five volts is a logical one. What does that automatically mean you have to be able to determine? You have to know very accurately what zero volts is. Now, that doesn't sound like a big trick. No voltage. Absolutely right. <laughs> Here's the problem. The INT building is actually three buildings. If you find the big seams in the building, those are mechanically separate pieces. Earthquake zone and all that stuff. Plus we're on an old baseball field. <laughs> Didn't hold up very well. There's a volt and a half difference from that end of the building to this end of the building if you connect to ground. Why? Because they're all, there are lots of different soil types and all that stuff, and it all combines to make a battery. Okay, so if you're looking for zero volts and I connect us with a wire, which one of us is right? Which one is zero? One of us is going to be a volt and a half higher than the other. You see the problem I'm laying out? Now, extend this to 6,000 feet. This building is 800 feet long. See, all sorts of little arcane information you learn in here. How long, ask the business people how long their building is sometimes. They won't be able to tell you. So when we're looking at thousands of feet intercity mileage, that natural difference in potential you can have just because of the way the soil is constituted around you becomes a big deal. One of the most expensive things when they used to build telephone central offices was the ground system. It's huge. There is an enormous amount of copper buried under Bell system offices. And for good reason. It's, it's, that's <laughs> controls the noise and all the reference in this. But we can make the job a little easier. We can go through all that and do what we need to do. We can actually make our job a little easier by just making a couple of tweaks to this. This is actually what's called a unipolar signal. I'm representing a logical one by saying a voltage. And I've inherently shown you, I haven't used the term, but I have shown you positive 5 volts. Nothing I've set up to this point implied a polarity. I just said 5 volts, or the presence of a voltage. So what we can do is tweak this a little bit. And we can still say the, at the presence of a voltage is a logical one and the absence of a voltage is a logical zero. But now I've made a difference. What's the average, if you count up the time slots there, what's the average voltage on this line? Zero volts. Hmm. A lot easier to determine what I reference this against. Okay. Here's what's, yes? Can we go back a slide? Sure. That one? Yeah. 
So we've changed the way we do this signaling. We're still saying the presence of a voltage means a 1, the absence of a voltage means a 0. I've just enforced a rule. Can you tell what the rule is? I'll give you a hint. The name of this scheme, this line coding scheme, is called alternate mark conversion. Every other logical one is represented by the polarity opposite what the last, lo last logical one <laughs> was. So in this case, I am signaling 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. But I've maintained my zero reference. What's the assumption I'm making? That there are about as many ones as zeros in this data stream. And that's a good assumption if you're moving coded human voice using PCM. If you're moving computer data, that's not a good assumption. We're going to come back to that thought. So by changing to this positive one, then negative one kind of scheme. Notice it's not every bit place. It's just every logical one that I represent that's inverted. I might have three zeros in a row, and that's fine. We're going to talk about zeros here in a second. I might have three zeros in a row, and that's fine. It's just that every one is going to alternate in polarity as I signal them. You okay with that? The term alternate mark inversion actually comes out of the period when this was. This was 15 years after World War II. Radio teletype was a digital over-the-air system. Used two frequencies for logical one and logical zero. And instead of calling them logical one and zero, even though that's what they were representing, the terms used were mark and space. Alternate mark inversion. Marks were ones, spaces were zeros. So, OK. Now. We all know that in the world, when you make plans, they don't always happen. Sometimes bad things happen. So what happens if I follow the rules and I send you a data word that, has, that follows alternate mark conversion strictly? I'm very confident that what I sent you had alternate polarity of ones. What happens if you receive something like this? What do you know? You know, there's a signal on the line. What, what, what can you tell with regard to what I sent you? You sent me something other than just a signal? No, nope. I sent you a perfectly formatted AMI signal. What's wrong with this picture if we're talking about AMI? What, what's the rule for AMI? I've got two positives in a row. The rule for AMI is every time I send a logical one, it's got to be opposite polarity to the one I just sent. OK, I've got positive, positive. My understanding of that at the receiving end is something bad happened. Can I tell what? Can I tell if a pulse was added or a pulse was subtracted? No, I can't. No. This, I could get this legitimately, assuming this started off as a correctly formatted waveform. I could actually get this two ways. I could have had original data where that was a, a 1, so I'd have 1, 1, 1, and the transmission system changed this to a 0. How would that happen? Noise to fill this in and cancel this. Not having a proper 0 reference. There are a lot of things that could cause it. But in other words, I could interpret this time slot to be a 0 instead of a 1. That would give me this result. I could also have this being two zeros and have noise or some other problem artificially put a one in there. The upshot is I can only tell that something bad has happened. I've still got it. <laughs> that something bad has happened. I can't tell what. So I can't reconstruct the data. Okay? Now, as I said, this relies on the thought that, excuse me, the assumption 
that you have about as many zeros as ones in your data stream over time. And that is a good assumption for voice, when it, human voice when it's coded. It's not a good assumption for everything. So keep that in mind. So we've got our ways of representing ones on the line. We've got some problems with them, but we can legitimately represent ones and zeros across the line. And we can do it over a usable distance. Now the problem is, remember the clapping thing? How could you forget? <laughs> we agreed on a rate. How do I do that? This is 1958. Okay, We don't have GPS satellites. We don't have any satellites. We're about to have one in the form of Sputnik. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to do some pretty fancy electronic tricks. The ability to create these bits in particular time slots is based on an electrical, electronic circuit called an oscillator. We're going to say generate a clock signal that I can use to time putting these bits out. Now I'm going to have it run at whatever rate it needs to run. You know, this is we're talking about T1, so I'm going to have it do. 1.544 megabits per second. So the clock is going to run at some rate that works well with that. Each end has its own oscillator, and they're designed to work at the same frequency. And nowadays, I'll tell you the truth, one of the hardest things for me to simulate in this lab for T1 is the problem I'm trying to describe here. We've got modern electronics. They are ultra-stable. I have a hard time making this thing get out of time. <laughs> in 1958, that wasn't the case. These things drifted terribly. So I could start them up. They could be designed to operate at the same speed, but they're going to, because temperature is going to be a little different, pressure is going to be a little different, these oscillators are going to run at slightly different rates. That blows my whole ability to move data. That introduces errors because you're not looking for a bit when I'm sending a bit. Okay? So what we're going to do is this. Each end has its own oscillator. We're going to specify one of these ends as being the master reference, and we're going to specify the others as being dependent on that master reference. It doesn't matter which end's which. I'm going to say this end is the reference oscillator. So think about the process. This end is clocking bits onto that line, right? So its oscillator is saying put a bit, put a bit, put a bit. And it's putting 0 or 1 depending on what it needs to represent. So those signals, are, those pulses are going across this line. We're going to tell this oscillator to watch the leading edge of the received pulses. Because if the oscillators are running at the same time, I should know exactly when that next pulse is coming through the window, right? I'm going to adjust the oscillator on this one to match the speed of the incoming data stream. Okay, you see how we can do that? Okay, now how am I going to clock bits going this way? I'm going to use that same oscillator, which I've adjusted to match this incoming stream, so my stream going this way is automatically in time. Okay, pretty cool. We'll look at that when we get in the lab a little bit. The trick on this is that it requires everybody to agree on what the reference is. This was very strictly enforced in the Bell days. And you got into trouble once we started having multiple long distance carriers, because ultimately, if you remember that Bell hierarchy, where do you think the reference was? The very top of that hierarchy. And it flowed, the reference flowed down through that system. When we start having multiple carriers, <laughs> now we've got multiple clock systems. That's really past the scope of this class. I'm just kind of pointing out an issue. We also have in here a problem built in with doing that. Remember that we're looking at the rising edges of these pulses to adjust the timing of our receive clock on the end that we said is dependent. Okay. If I put too many zeros in this bit stream, 
And since we're representing a zero with no voltage, no zeros, <laughs> no rising edges, no rising edges, no synchronization. So in other words, we've created a problem here. Our whole timing is based on having about as many ones as zeros in a data stream. Remember I said there was a good assumption for voice. <coughs> Why would this change between the time we invented it and let's drive, let's say, 1980? At the time this was invented, and I made a big point when we first started talking about this, that this was a digital system that was not designed to move data. It was designed to move the human voice. How often are we sending a sample of our input audio? How many times, is, how many samples a second are we using? And how many bits are we using for each sample? Okay. Eight bits. So eight bits define 256 possible amplitudes is what we're using it for. So if I flip one bit, how much of a difference have I made in the audio waveform? At worst, I flip the bit that causes the largest change in that sample which means one eight thousandth of your audio is maybe half off in terms of the amplitude level. You're never going to hear it. Do you see what I'm describing? I'm describing a digital system where it really doesn't matter if a fair number of those bits get trashed. You know, as long as the stream's reasonably intact, it's going to sound okay. I know it's warm in here, and I know it's sleepy. I appreciate. I see some fighting. I appreciate it. Here's the issue. For a, system, for a system that's carrying human voice, big deal. In fact, the normal operating specification for the Bell system, the people who invented this and wanted to run well, the normal operating spec was it was okay to have one error in every 10 to the fifth bits. And that sounds like a lot until you realize that's about 10 bits a second. That's about 10 errors a second. Let's fast forward this to 1980. Now we're using computer data over the same network. And the data describes, oh, I don't know, your checking account balance. Now I'm going to throw 10 errors that are describing your checking account balance every second. Yeah, <laughs> admittedly, depending on which way the errors go, it might not be a bad thing. But law of average being what it is, you're going to lose money eventually. <laughs> the short version is, for voice, we can be pretty sloppy with this. For data, we can't. I'm kind of skipping over some intermediate. There were actually about four variations of the voice system on this before we really started doing data, and I'm just skipping all of that. We're actually moving up to the one we use nowadays pretty quickly. But we still have a problem with too many zeros. If we don't have enough zeros, that synchronization process doesn't happen. I don't have any rising edges. I can't detect rising edges that they aren't there, so I can't use those to collect, correct my clock. The spec they came up with was that we needed one logical one in every 16 bits coming across that link, one in 16. That means you can have no more than 15 zeros in a row. Okay? Framing won't take care of it. Framing comes close, but I can get, remember I've only got one framing bit out of every 193 bits. So I've got 192 bits that theoretically could all be zero. And that's not a good thing particularly if I said I need every 15. So what we're going to do is do some thinking about this. We're going to realize that the actual problem, we have 255, I'm sorry, 256 possible data words of 8 bits. We have to have one bit in every 15. So what's the only data word that can cause a problem? 
all zeros. Zero, 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 zero. And Anything else has a one in it. Is LSB least significant? Least significant bit, yeah. That was an old solution. I, don't, I left it in the slide because you'll run across it. Bit stuffing was the early solution to this. We just simply said, okay, we've got to have one bit in every 15. We'll just take the least significant bit in each data word and make it be a one. Again, for voice, big deal. For data, what it means I can't, is that I can't use that bit. So what I've just done is reduced my throughput from 8 bits times 8,000 samples a second to 7 bits times 8,000 samples a second, from 64 kilobits to 56 kilobits. And now here's another magic number for you. Remember setting up serial interfaces on a Cisco router? Remember the command speed? What were your two choices for speed? 56 or 64. That's why. Okay. <coughs> Aside from the fact that this is cl a clunky engineering solution, people actually filed suit against AT&T because they were contracting for 64 kilobits per second moved across this link for data. And what AT&T was delivering was 56 kilobits per second moved across this link. So we needed a better solution. Recognizing that only the only one of those data words that was a problem was all zeros, we came up with a pretty interesting solution. The other thing that's happened in those 20 years between 1960 and 1980 is so we've got microprocessors. We can do a lot of processing cheaply in small devices. Okay? So here's what we did. The only word that's a problem is when the actual data we're trying to represent is all zeros. So what we're going to do is hand that to this coding process, but we're going to modify the world just a little bit. We're still doing AMI to keep everything nice. But what we're going to do is tell the sending end, when you see a data word that consists of all zeros, you're going to substitute a data word of 00011011, exactly that data word. And that's what you're going to transmit across the link. Great. No more ones density problem, right? I've got plenty of ones in there. The problem is I've changed the data. So the receiving end sees something different than what I was trying to send across this link. It's a problem. But with microprocessors, I have enough processing power. I can say, watch all the data words. When you see a data word of 00011011 come across this link, I want you to stop. That's the only word you have to worry about. Anything else, send straight on through. When you see this word, I want you to look at it carefully. Because we need to recognize that this word has been changed. Could this occur naturally in a data stream? Absolutely. So I need to know when it's OK to pass exactly this word on out to the application and when I need to change it back to zeros. How do I do that? When I transmit it, I code this word, and I force a bipolar violation in the fifth and seventh bit place. Okay. So what I'm telling you to look for is look for exactly this data word when you see it, let any other word go straight through. When you see this data word, look at the fifth and seventh bit place and see if there's a bipolar violation. And it doesn't matter if it's too, too negative or too positive. It must be a bipolar violation. If you see that, substitute eight zeros and hand that to the application. I've solved my problem. Okay. Could we have a situation where you get exactly that data word with a naturally occurring bipolar violation in the fifth and seventh bit places? Yeah. The chances of this data word occurring exactly across an eight bit, bit sample is pretty slim. The chances of getting a bipolar violation in that data word is slim. And the chances of getting that data word naturally occurring and a bipolar violation in exactly that position or slim cube. I'll take the one time in a trillion that it happens. Okay, I'll deal with it. 
for all the other, what's a trillion minus one? For all the rest of that, I'm okay. okay. Pretty slick. Okay. The advantage is now we can use this for data, and I can move 64 kilobits across the link. Okay. Let me see where I am. I may actually. Yeah, the last we only have we only have two slides, three slides left, but they're big ones, so we'll pick them up on Friday. <laughs> okay, see you guys. I beg your pardon? I said you have to sign the mini.